Thank you again, Corey. It's uh, nice to be back so soon. Uh, you've given me 20 minutes. You gave my colleagues 30 minutes, I noticed, to do. <laughs> I'm just not fair. What can I say? <laughs> yes, really. So uh, why has everything beyond bevacizumab have failed in angiogenesis inhibition? And so uh, once again, I have nothing to disclose. And I'm probably not going to give you a really good answer to the question when it comes down to it. So clearly, angiogenesis is very important in cancer. We need to be able to turn it off because something in cancer turned it on. And we have tried to turn off the switches a whole bunch of times. But the only switch turning off that has succeeded really so far has been targeting the VEGF system. And this is a very simplified cartoon of all of the things that have been looked at. So what most of us are most familiar with is bevacizumab, which is the anti-VEGF ligand up here. We'll talk a little bit today about ramucirumab, which is undergoing studies now, as well as some of the small molecule inhibitors. So we'll get to those. So before we answer the question of why nothing besides bevacizumab succeeds, I think we have to address the clinical question of does bevacizumab itself actually succeed? And fortunately, my colleagues who have come before me at this podium today have, have answered a lot of the questions about their subsets of patients for which bevacizumab may succeed. But looking at the outcomes with Bev, they are all quite modest. And so have we really done the best job of selecting patients to use these drugs? I'm not quite sure. You've already seen the survival curve for ECOG 4599 with a median survival benefit in the overall patient population of about two months. There's a significant overall survival benefit with adenocarcinomas of greater magnitude, about four months. But in avail, a question that Corey alluded to a little bit earlier, there is despite a significant benefit in progression-free survival, no overall survival benefit. What's the difference? You may note that the median survival for the control population of cisgemcitabine, which I apologize you can't see on this slide very well, was 13.1 months, which is about the same as the median overall survival in the PAC carbo-BEV arm of ECOG 4599. So is it, is it just that this is the number we get to? Is there a difference with the chemotherapy? We really don't know, and point break may answer some of those questions. So there is a significant and consistent progression-free survival benefit in both of these trials, but what are we missing with overall survival? And for some of us, a progression-free survival advantage with a hazard ratio between 0.6 and 0.8 is enough. And for some of us, we need to find something that works a little bit better. So Jean-Charles Surya published this year a meta-analysis meta of randomized clinical trials that included a, a phase two clinical trial as well. These are they and decided based on this meta-analysis of about 2,200 patients that the overall survival was improved, but the hazard ratio is 0.9. And so is that a clinically significant or just a statistically significant overall survival? And again, we see a better improvement in PFS than in overall survival. And again, the best results are in adenocarcinomas. And again, the best results are in good performance status patients with a surrogate here as less than 5% weight loss. So, Overall survival advantage is most important, again, in the adenocarcinoma patients, so do we need to be selecting better? You've already seen the avaparillin point, uh, point break trials that uh, Dr. Evans presented to you, and so I won't go through those uh, again for the sake of my 20 versus 30 minutes. Uh, and you've also already seen the ECOG 55, uh, 5508 trial looking at the question of whether it's just the PEM that makes things better when you use BevPEM together. And so we're very interested to await the results of this trial, which I understand is accruing extremely well. So where are we now? VEGFR and angiogenesis are clearly important targets. We're still not, I would argue, sure exactly how best to attack them. We only see an overall survival benefit in 4599, and the lack of confirmation of this in other studies, I think, is of concern despite the meta-analysis. But other anti-angiogenic targets may be a better way once we figure out how to use them properly. We did some, or uh, ECOG did some biomarker analysis of 4599, ranging from clinical biomarkers, sex and hypertension, you've heard a little bit about this already, uh, to biologic biomarkers, ICAM and VEGF. So, 
with sex, we all know the results showing that despite a very high PFS difference in the female population, there was no overall survival advantage in the female population. Uh, hazard ratio 0.69 for males, uh, for, uh, males and 0.96 for females. With hypertension, there seems to be a predictive advantage for survival with hypertension uh, versus not, and this was published in the JCO a couple of years ago. Biomarkers, the adhesion molecule ICAM may predict better overall response and survival with a response rate of 32 versus 14% if ICAM is low, and that was statistically significant, a retrospective analysis, of course. Overall survival, 65 versus 25% in this population. High VEGF seems to predict response, but not overall survival. And there's this intriguing issue of early assessment of E-selectin, so at seven weeks, which seem to predict better overall survival. So some things to look at in the future. Uh, there are some other studies ongoing. So this is ramucirumab, which is being looked at in both non-squamous and squamous histology. This hits the receptor itself rather than the ligand. And it's being looked at both in the first line study, this uh, slide that I just showed you, and in the second line setting with docetaxel as a comparator. So why have I put this hideous slide up here? Uh, I've put this hideous slide up here because the overall and progression-free survival benefits even in these clinically selected populations are relatively modest. And so what is happening? This dizzying array of interacting pathways is available for the cancer cells to use to help the cancer cells overcome the beneficial effect of the anti-angiogenic uh, treatments. And so a number of preclinical and clinical st uh, studies are going on to look at platelet factors, endothelial factors, and factors from the tumor cells themselves. We have to think about, should we target alternative pathways that can be used for resistance? This slide is now, I think, about 10 years old. But uh, after VEGF blockade, you get upregulation of FGF, PDGF, EGF, and others. And maybe if you can block those, you can overcome this resistance mechanism. Very interesting data on a novel agent, which is an extracellular matrix protein. Uh, we all remember the disappointing data with the MMPs, which initially looked so promising. Well, this is a, the sort of back end of that. So the EGFL7 appears to be enriched in tumors. It helps make blood vessels better after drugs like bevacizumab impair angiogenesis. And it helps to promote these sort of perivascular tracts that let blood vessels grow again. So this has been looked at in the laboratory and in some phase one data that look, look very interesting. And there is a, uh, an ongoing trial, the Nile trial, which is enrolling patients. Now, uh, this drug now has a name. It's now called parcetuzumab. And so this will be very interesting to follow. What about going back to strictly the anti-angiogenic system and looking at small molecules? Well, so far there hasn't been any improvement in overall survival, but there again has been a smattering of improvement in both response and progression-free survival. Uh, Flibercept, which was uh, hoped for efficacy, did not improve on chemotherapy by itself. There may be some single agent activity of some of the other uh, drugs that are approved in other solid tumors like serafinib, sunitinib, uh, sidirinib, but there have been no real predictive markers in lung cancer, and it's unclear really how to use them optimally. And of, of course, vandetinib did not show an overall survival advantage. There was, just as there was a meta-analysis for bevacizumab this year, there was a meta-analysis for these small molecule anti-angiogenic TKIs, which was published in the European Journal of Pharmacology, which looked at about 3,000 patients in six trials, included what you can see here, and showed a significant increase in PFS in the meta-analysis, but unfortunately, again, no overall survival differences, despite an improvement in response rate. So where are we? So we have ECOG 4599 showing an overall survival advantage, and we have a lot of other studies with a lot of advantages in response and progression, but with no overall survival advantage. So what do we do? I'm not answering the question why, you'll notice still. Uh, it, the, the landscape is complicated, and I'm going to spend the remainder of the discussion today talking about nintetinib, which for some reason I have a great deal of difficulty saying. Um, and this is a, a compound which has been studied in the second line and was presented at ASCO this year by Martin Reck. 
So this is the so-called Lumilung-1 trial, a randomized double-blind phase three trial versus docetaxel alone. This is the molecule. So this is a nice molecule to study because it is a very promiscuous inhibitor, which is good. This is what you want, something that will hit a lot of pathways as long as it does it well. Uh, there is no CYP450 interaction issue, which is a huge deal with the clinical trials we do today in the lung cancer population. And the safety profile seems manageable, and it's been looked at with several different chemotherapies, so this is an attractive target to develop. And there is a little bit of evidence of single agent activity in a phase two trial. So this was a good thing to look at. Here is the design of the LUMI-1 study. Uh, this was stage 3B or 4 patients or recurrent patients who had failed first-line platinum-based chemotherapy. This is all comers histologically. They are randomized one-to-one -to, -one to docetaxel, standard dosing with or without the nintetinib, which is given orally twice daily and is started the day after chemotherapy because of concern over whether there would be any interaction. Uh, the patients were stratified by performance status, whether they had had BEV or not, histology in the presence of brain mets, and this was done mostly in Europe and Asia. The major inclusion criteria were confirmation of disease, all histologies, failure after first-line therapy, and good performance status, and patients could not go on if they had had other VEGF uh, agents except for BEV, and they could not go on if they were so-called so active brain mets. So if they had brain mets that had been treated, they could go on. And cavitary or necrotic tumors were an exclusion because of concern over bleeding. Primary endpoint was progression-free survival. Imaging was performed at six-week intervals, which is important to assess the PFS uh, stats. And the secondary endpoint is overall survival with preplanned analysis by histology and by the intent-to-treat population. Consort diagram shows that they screened about 1,700 patients to randomize 1,300, and the non-randomized were primarily because they didn't meet eligibility criteria. They did an excellent job with this patient population. This is a large patient population, and you can see that the baseline demographics are extremely well balanced in between all of the arms. And the past oncologic history is extremely well balanced in between all of the arms. So there are not a lot of overtly confounding things that you would see here. Here is the primary PFS endpoint. This was done by independent central review with a median survival of 3.4 months with the active agent versus 2.7 months with the placebo. Again, this is a highly statistically significant PFS difference. Is this a clinically significant PFS difference? One is left to wonder. Bearing in mind, however, that this is in the second line setting. Uh, looking at the breakdown by the two major histologies, and uh, I glossed over it quickly, but this accounted for the vast majority of patients, and it was very close. Adenos just a smidge more than squamous in this, um, in this uh, eligible patient population. And you can see 2.8 versus four months PFS in the adenocarcinomas, and 2.6 versus 2.9 months in the squamous carcinomas. Please note, again, these are both statistically significant. It is very hard to argue that a 0.3-month difference is clinically significant, despite the statistical significance. Overall survival is shown here, and this is in patients with adenocarcinoma with 12.6 months. Now, remember the median survival in the first-line carbopac bev this is second-line docetaxel lintendinib. That looks very, very similar, doesn't it? And again, a little bit more than a two-month overall difference. And remember, this is the adenocarcinomas. In the squamous carcinomas, we obviously do not see an overall survival benefit, which does not surprise us given the PFS data. Uh, in all patients, we see that there was a one-month difference, non-statistically significant, so uh, again, not surprising based on the data. Uh, these are not patients that respond very much. This is the second line. We already know that there are very few responses to docetaxel in the second line. PRs occurred in about 4 or 5% of patients at best, so the majority of this is disease control or stable disease. And there was a stati statistically significant improvement in the disease control rate in the uh, experimental arm. The other thing that these investigators did very well was they captured very well what their patients got later. And so uh, this is going to be very useful for future comparisons, I think. What was it? Were there any safety issues? As is usual in these studies, the vast majority of patients in both arms had some kind of AE. 
Uh, most of these were not significant. The number of AEs that led to discontinuation were the same between the two arms, and the incidence of serious AEs were the same in between the two arms. So the authors presented this as their summary. They felt that the trial met its primary endpoint, that there was a significant prolongation in PFS for all patients, regardless of histology. Remember my caveat about the squamous histology being uh, statistically, but perhaps not clinically significant. Uh, significant improvement in overall survival in adenocarcinoma patients with a hazard ratio of 0 0.83 and a good p-value of less than 0.04, uh, median, again, a two-month survival benefit, which is a survival benefit that we sort of hold on to in lung cancer as something that is probably clinically meaningful. Safety was manageable, and the investigators have suggested further investigation. I certainly think that this would be something that would be reasonable to look at in the first line. So what don't we know? Uh, I would argue that we still don't know how best to give bevacizumab. We've been giving it for a long time, but we still don't know how best to do it. Uh, we still don't know whether there will be benefit of treatment beyond disease progression. Huge topic comes up all the time. We still don't know what the best thing is to join with the anti-angiogenics, be it bevacizumab or something else. And we still don't know all that we need to know about prognostic factors. So does Bev succeed? Well, yes, it does in some patients. It would be nice to know up front which. We need to sort that out. We need to investigate how long to continue, and we need to decide if there are better alternatives for some selected and Corey's definition of unselected patient populations. Uh, have the other anti-angiogenics actually failed? Well, for the most part, probably many of them have. There are PFS and overall, survive, overall response uh, advantages, but no overall survival benefits, except for the nintedinib, BIBF1120, uh, which did show overall survival improvement in an adenocarcinoma histology in the second line and as a secondary trial endpoint, and again, with not clearly certain uh, clinical significance. So why have the other anti-angiogenics failed? I still don't know the answer to that question. We probably can't answer it with the data that we have on hand. At least I can't answer it with the data we have on hand, but we need to continue to look, probably for the same reason that I'm not sure that bevacizumab has succeeded resoundingly. We certainly need better uh, designed trials with prospective translational endpoints. We need to get tissue on all of these patients. We need to do our clinical trials designs quite differently, and for that we need partners in pharma and in the regulatory agencies that help us to do these things, and we need to give both patients and their physicians, especially patients and physicians who are not near an academic center, the opportunity to participate in these trials. And with thanks to my colleagues who presented some of the data that I did, didn't have to present, I have given you two minutes, Corey. Oh, thank you. <laughs>